Thank you, Michael. Thanks to the Institute for this invitation, which I find both very friendly and courageous. Friendly, not the least from a personal perspective, because it provides me with an opportunity to come back to Ireland, where, for a reason I can't quite understand, I haven't been for quite some time. Courageous, because some of the messages uh, that I'll have today uh, are unfriendly for a country such as Ireland, uh, where agriculture, and in particular where the payments received from Brussels uh, play such an important role. And I'm very grateful to you, Michael, for having indicated where the emergency exit is. So if, if it's becoming too unfriendly, then you, you know where and how you can leave this room. Now, Europe, and I don't need to remind you of that, is in a very deep crisis at this very moment very deep indeed. Uh, it's uh, the debt crisis uh, that has hit a number of countries, uh, Greece of course in particular, uh, and that is indeed uh, driving many policymakers into deep despair. Angela Merkel is on record of uh, having said, and I believe it's a uh, reference to uh, a statement by uh, <coughs> a great British uh, statesman, uh, that uh, this is uh, Europe's toughest hour since the Second World War. And indeed, some begin uh, to feel that the cohesiveness uh, of uh, Europe as uh, one of the most magnificent creations uh, political nature after the Second World War is severely threatened. When it comes to the economic implications, uh, everybody appears to agree that uh, what's needed now is rigid fiscal discipline uh, and structural improvement uh, to uh, structural adjustment to improve uh, the competitiveness of uh, Europe's economy. And you would have thought that should apply to all sectors of the economy, uh, to all areas uh, of policy making. As it happens, uh, in that very phase, the Commission, Brussels, uh, had to table their uh, proposals for the future of the uh, common agricultural policy, which, uh, as you know, have come out on um, 12 October. Uh, it's certainly not the Commission's fault uh, that there is this uh, coincidence, uh, but you would have thought that in that particular situation, uh, the uh, proposals tabled by the Commission uh, would have shown some degree of response to that particular combination of problems, uh, in particular that they would be characterized uh, by a willingness to save public uh, money and uh, to do something very serious to improve the competitiveness uh, of the EU economy. That would have been important challenges, but the challenges that the Commission has identified, uh, in particular in the uh, earlier document they uh, issued in, in November 2010, uh, were sort of strictly agricultural uh, challenges. Uh, food security, uh, in particular at the global level, uh, was identified as one particular challenge. Uh, low levels of farm income, uh, if uh, calculated per uh, working hour in agriculture uh, and compared to incomes in the rest of the economy uh, are a problem in the eyes of uh, the Commission. Uh, the need to do more to uh, save uh, the environment uh, and uh, in particular to uh, reduce the pressure for climate change, uh, something where agriculture uh, according to the Commission, needs to make a contribution. Uh, and then the issue of territorial balance uh, and the fact that some regions uh, are falling increasingly uh, behind oral developments. Uh, I have no doubts uh, that uh, all these challenges are real. Uh, I would love uh, to go into uh, more detail on that. Uh, perhaps we can do some of that uh, during the discussion period. It's a matter, though, uh, of how they should best be met. Uh, and uh, I think for each of these challenges, uh, one can easily think of a set of specifically targeted 
policies uh, that would best be suited uh, to dealing with that uh, particular uh, challenge. Uh, some of these policies, by the way, uh, are uh, of a more general nature and have uh, relatively little to do with uh, what we uh, traditionally uh, refer to as the common agricultural policy. While the Commission has identified these uh, four major challenges, uh, there are two other challenges uh, they've not really spoken about uh, in either their more general document or the concrete uh, legal proposals that have come out now. <laughs> and the first one is the budgetary uh, challenge. Uh, <coughs> The Commission, as uh, I guess you all know, has uh, issued a document in uh, June this year sort of outlining the uh, overall budget they believe Europe uh, should have. Uh, that uh, overall budget proposal by the Commission, at least in my mind, can't really be uh, called a, a sort of rigid uh, budget in the sense of trying to save uh, public money. When it comes to the common agricultural policy, uh, the original idea uh, discussed in the Commission was to uh, keep the budget at least constant in nominal terms after 2013, when the current uh, multi-annual financial framework runs out. I think even that couldn't have been uh, called a major saving. But when you then look at the actual proposal uh, that the Commission has made, uh, that even foresees some increase in normal expenditure and only a very minor decrease in inflation corrected expenditure. Uh, these are the uh, amounts uh, for the overall seven year period 2014 uh, 20 compared to expenditure uh, in. Uh, the current period 2011, uh, 2007 40. I'm afraid uh, not everything is uh, really coming out here. This is uh, the expenditure that was actually uh, made 2007 to 14. Uh, the second uh, bar is the planned expenditure 2014-20, uh, all of this in current prices. Uh, and then we have the same thing uh, in inflation corrected uh, prices uh, the uh, right hand side there, there's a quite a bit of uh, creative accounting in the uh, commission uh, budget proposal uh, with new forms of expenditure uh, that do not fall under the traditional heading uh, of the common agricultural policy if you include that then you can see that in uh, current prices this would amount uh, to an increase of expenditure uh, around 3%. If you uh, correct it for inflation, then the decrease is no more than 7%. Uh, now, a major part of that uh, planned expenditure uh, would continue to go for direct payments, uh, nearly 70% of all of that. And that uh, leads me to a second challenge uh, that I find the Commission has failed to identify, uh, and that has to do with the future uh, of these direct payments, which really form the core of the current common agricultural policy. Certainly, when you look at expenditure, set 70% uh, of the total cap budget, both in the past and in the future, uh, are allocated uh, to direct payments. Now, these payments were introduced uh, when serious reform of the common agricultural policy began under uh, Irish Commissioner uh, McSherry in 92, mm -hmm. when support prices were cut, uh, and therefore farm incomes uh, would have come under serious pressure without any additional measure. Uh, so compensation payments were introduced at the time. That was absolutely necessary. I don't have the slightest uh, doubts on that. Uh, it also was uh, absolutely beneficial to decouple these payments from production, uh, as has happened uh, under uh, Commissioner Franz Fischler. Uh, all this was good policy, and it uh, shouldn't have been any different. Over time, though, of course, the compensation argument 
fades. Uh, you can expect people affected uh, by major policy reforms to sort of gradually adjust to the new situation, and at some point then uh, a new world uh, has been established in their environment, and they should no longer need compensation. We cannot, in all parts of our economy, whenever we reform policies, compensate the losers uh, for the rest of all times. That, of course, opens up the question about the future of these direct payments, and the Commission doesn't even discuss that question, uh, to my surprise. Uh, they, they don't say, now, look, we, we, we need to take a very fundamental decision as to what to do with these payments in the future. They, they don't see that as a problem. They proceed directly to saying they continue to be the solution. There will be direct payments uh, in the future as well. Sounds like there aren't any alternatives uh, to direct payments and uh, what they're supposed to achieve, but of course there are. One can use much, much more targeted policies, and I'll say a few more words about their nature in a moment, uh, that are much different from these payments per hectare. They're now made on a per hectare basis, which isn't really targeting any specific services that society wants agriculture uh, to provide. And if one were to move in that direction, that wouldn't mean that the direct payments would have to disappear overnight. Uh, one can do that in a gradual way. Sort of policy continuity can be uh, uh, well provided uh, by uh, having a relatively long transitory period. But what would be important, in my mind, is to say explicitly where the policy is going in the future. Uh, to announce the schedule uh, of future payments uh, and then uh, that farmers gradually adjust to uh, that situation. Farmers would then adjust. Indeed, very importantly, land prices uh, would adjust as well. Uh, the current direct payments, since they are made on a per hectare basis, have a strong tendency to keep land prices uh, significantly higher than they would be in the absence of these uh, payments, which uh, undermines competitiveness uh, of Europe's agriculture. After all, uh, land cost is one major uh, cost element in agriculture. Uh, and farmers uh, were then, uh, by being gradually uh, weaned off these payments, uh, become uh, more free to uh, act in the marketplace uh, without permanent support uh, to which typically all sorts of strings are also attached. Now, targeting uh, public payments uh, in agriculture to specific things one wants to achieve essentially means uh, to pay farmers for providing public goods. And there are all sorts of public goods that they do provide, no doubt about uh, that. Uh, but if you want uh, to support that in a targeted way, you first need to consider what is the nature of these public goods in each specific location. Uh, you want uh, to measure the cost of providing them and then make payments uh, equivalent uh, to that uh, cost. You want to enter into contractual arrangements with farmers for them to provide these services uh, as a quid pro quo uh, for receiving these payments. The payments would be made not on a per hectare basis, uh, but on a basis uh, of uh, the units of public goods uh, that are provided. And the result of that, of course, would be that payments would differ significantly from place to place because the nature of the public goods required, but also the cost of providing them, uh, is, uh, in a spatial sense, uh, rather different uh, across the community. Uh, since you do it in a more targeted way, uh, you, you can also uh, save quite a bit of public expenditure. All this is something that we've described uh, in much detail in the OECD, and I can't uh, really go any further 
here in this short presentation. The point I want to make simply is it's not like there aren't any alternatives. There are alternative policies uh, that we can pursue uh, that are much more effective but also much more efficient. Now, that's not what the Commission has proposed. <laughs> Rather than sort of moving gradually away from the big payments, uh, they have proposed to reshuffle these payments. Uh, they would still be made on a per hectare basis. And the major aim, in my interpretation, of the thrust behind the Commission's proposals, <coughs> and that also has been said explicitly by the Commission in November 2010, is to make the payments more understandable to the taxpayer. So, to make them politically more digestible. Uh, and uh, that will be done in particular uh, by uh, trying to respond to uh, some of the most uh, acute political criticism of uh, the payment uh, regime that we currently have, uh, which has to do with the equity matters uh, and their environmental uh, implications. The equity thing is some receive much, others receive less, and the the Commission proposes uh, sort of various different changes uh, to deal with that uh, problem. Uh, redistribution across countries so that the new member countries in the East would become more, the old would become less, make them more equal in that uh, dimension. Uh, across farm categories, uh, some farmers currently receive uh, larger payments uh, than others in the same country, depending on their past uh, production structure. Uh, that would be evened out. Uh, large farms would no longer receive quite so much more than small farms. There would be degressivity. Uh, there would even be capping for very large farms. Uh, and then a new uh, definition would uh, be introduced uh, that uh, makes sure only active farmers uh, in the sense of not receiving um, less than 5% of their income from agriculture uh, would uh, be uh, the only uh, people eligible. That, that would exclude people to, uh, such as the Queen of England. Uh, from uh, receiving these uh, payments. Now, if you think a bit about it, uh, then uh, that doesn't really do a lot to improve equity. Equity, in a general sense, is a matter of the actual income that somebody receives, and uh, is that uh, below a certain line uh, in order to uh, provide payments in an equitable way? Uh, Way in that sense, uh, you need to engage in a means test. Uh, paying everybody the same uh, makes payments more equal, but not more equitable. If I receive the same payment as my neighbor, that's not equitable at all, because I happen, fortunately enough, to have a higher income than my neighbor. Uh, so. Uh, I can't really see that as improving equity, really. It does so in a rather superficial sense. Now, the environment issue uh, the Commission responds to by um, proposing a greening component, uh, which essentially is something uh, such as, uh, you, you could call it super cross-compliance. Farmers have to respect certain conditions uh, for them to be eligible to receive these payments. Uh, that's much different from targeted uh, measures uh, provided per unit of environmental service. Uh, just to give you an example of a more technical uh, nature, uh, what the, the, the Commission has proposed uh, that all farmers uh, receiving that greening component, um, which uh, would form 30% of uh, the future direct payments, uh, would have to uh, use 7% of their area uh, as an <coughs> ecological focus area uh, rather than uh, for agricultural production. That's certainly too much in some cases, uh, too little in some other uh, places. Um, crop rotation uh, is uh, required, three different crops uh, at the same time. In some farms it would be much more sensible to have that in a sequential way uh, year after year rather than in parallel. Uh, I understand that's a particular issue also here in Ireland. 
Now, more fundamentally, uh, the big thing the uh, Commission uh, appears to be heading towards is to make these payments uh, a permanent feature of the common agricultural policy for ever. By so, cutting their substantive connection and relationship with the past and introducing new justifications and uh, new payment parameters uh, that have nothing to do with this compensation function that these payments uh, have uh, had in the past. Uh, and uh, one of the major justifications uh, proposed now is uh, that in the European Union, farmers have to respect uh, environmental and other standards uh, that are much above that in the rest of the world. That may or may not be the case. I haven't seen uh, any evidence being provided by the Commission, or for that matter by any other uh, European government, uh, of uh, the uh, extra cost that really results from these uh, so-called higher standards uh, and whether uh, the REC payments uh, are in any way uh, so equivalent to uh, these extra costs. Uh, so it's a vague argument uh, without any evidence whatsoever. Now, having uh, sort of criticized these proposals so fundamentally, I must hasten to say, yes, there are also some uh, positive elements in uh, that uh, big package of proposals, something like 1,500 pages, I believe it, uh, they are, uh, more emphasis will be placed on innovation. 1.2% of the budget would go for that. Is that much? I think one can discuss that. Small farmers, according to the proposals, uh, can take their payments out of agriculture to the year 2020 uh, when they um, transfer their farm to a different farm. Well, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, the Commission has now finally proposed uh, an elimination of sugar quotas. Uh, and so on. Uh, so there are a couple of positive elements. Some people also say the well, one very positive thing about these proposals is that they do not suggest to go back to uh, the outdated policies of the past, more market <coughs> interference uh, or some things such as counter-cyclical payments like in the US. I find that as relatively weak to praise proposals for them not containing sort of two negative elements. Uh, so that's why I've uh, put that in brackets. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, problematic uh, elements uh, also uh, that in part would even uh, turn back the clock of past reforms. Uh, <laughs> more scope for couple of payments uh, belongs there. Uh, a new income stabilization tool that's now proposed as an element of uh, the rural development package in Pillar 2, uh, in my mind, belongs uh, there. Uh, until 2008, the Commission themselves have said uh, such a measure could uh, generate large and very erratic budget expenditure. Uh, what's more, uh, yes, agricultural markets are very volatile, and therefore it sounds like a great idea to help farmers sort of live with that. But the nature of that volatility, as we have very clearly seen in the past few years, is such that once in a while there is a major peak in agricultural prices, uh, and hence a major increase uh, in incomes, uh, but that's not matched by equivalent uh, troughs. Uh, so you, you have sort of the, 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 the normal fluctuations, and then uh, suddenly comes a peak. Now, if that's the situation, and if you then uh, follow a rule like the Commission has proposed, uh, an income drops uh, by more than 30% below the average of the past three years, then, of course, you have situations where by uh, the three-year average uh, is pushed up very high as a result of high prices in the past. And that then, indeed, if you calculate according to that rule, uh, makes farmers receive payments in compensation for them having had particularly high incomes the last two years or so. Something where my logic has a bit of problem in terms of understanding why that should be needed. Now, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I hope it's not the end of uh, cap reform, really. 
Uh, we've had a succession of three commissioners for agriculture, all of which were strong-minded, very successful and courageous reformers. McSherry, Fischler, Fischer, Boer. They all have really changed the face of the common agricultural policy for the better, and the European Union has received a lot of praise uh, for these reforms in various fora, including the OECD. It's now time to continue with that reform. I would have thought the common agricultural policy has gone from market support, originally where support was provided per ton of production, to decoupling where it was provided per hectare and should now move in the phase of targeting where it's provided per unit of public good. That's unfortunately not what the Commission's proposals aim at. But as I said, they also don't aim at uh, responding to the current deep crisis. The Farm Commissioner is on record of having said the biggest obstacle we, we the agricultural policy makers, face is getting the budget that we need. When I hear these things, I, I get the impression there is some sort of deep split between the agricultural world and, and the rest of the world. And in agriculture, it appears one hasn't sort of taken aboard the fact that Europe indeed has a very deep crisis at this moment. Uh, therefore, one cannot simply continue with policies like one did in the past. I don't see much uh, aiming at structural adjustment or improved competitiveness. I have difficulties understanding why this should be a called a deep and ambitious reform. I'm not even sure it's politically viable because Parliament and Council will still have to uh, look at it and uh, it does not at this moment uh, uh, look like uh, they're all very happy with that, but maybe uh, when they come to decide in the new trialogue, something much better will out, uh, come out of that package uh, than what the Commission has proposed. That's at least my Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, sorry if this was not a uh, very pleasant message for a country uh, that received so much money from Brussels, some of which would be greatly reduced if the Commission were to follow uh, advice uh, like I've uh, proposed here. Thank you very much.